All right, <clears throat> here we go. Okay, okay, here we go. Okay. Walking to Sky, chapter one. I bought a bookshelf on Gumtree recently. Um, it, it was an amazing experience. I'll quickly tell you about it and then I'll read the book. But I found it strange because it, it made me start to think about the way like our methods of communication have sort of changed over the years. You know, in the old days, if you wanted a bookshelf, you'd just go see Gareth the bookshelf guy because he was the dude in your tribe that made the bookshelves. He had a little bookshelf cave. He was reputable. Now any mad can sell their on Gumtree. You know what I mean? As a species, we're sort of able to cope with knowing and, and gossiping about around like 100 or 150 people. That's like the limit of our tribe. Any more than that, it starts to get confusing, which is why we created abstract constructs like territories and deities to unite larger groups of people under an imaginary common factor. And it works a trick because we only really gather en masse on special occasions. But I think like social media and it's so all that up you know I don't think we're we're able to deal with the thousands of people we're connected to on a daily basis and as a result we neglect our immediate 150 you know that's why I never get invited to parties anymore it's not because I ramble on about veganism and old ladies <laughs> it's because I'm not on Facebook and everybody just assumes you are I am so behind on the births deaths and marriages of my friends that I feel like the time traveler's wife every time I go to a party I'm like this is uh, Tim, he's our son, he's six now, and didn't even know you were pregnant. <laughs> anyway, and you know smartphones aren't that great? You know that, right? They're not. They're not that great. You don't need the internet in your pocket. You work at Coles, okay? You're not working for the president. <laughs> you don't need it. You don't need that much information. And also, what was the point of developing opposable thumbs for you to take a photo of your head, and post it on the internet, and then just stand by for validation? <laughs> no one gives a f about your head. They'll only validate it in order to gain permission to post a photo of their own head on the internet and stand by for validation. <laughs> give a f about your head will at some point see it in real life. <laughs> f your head and the neck it rode in on. <laughs> your vanity is sucking up my bandwidth. <laughs> anyway, this is what's going through my head as I'm on Gumtree looking for a bookshelf because oh, you know when you put something in on the on the in the, like in the search in book tree in book tree? What the f when you put something in the search on Gumtree, I'm having a stroke up here. Um, yeah, when you put something in the search, right, and, and like there's always a couple of things that come up in the list that are like the polar opposite of what you search for. I'm like, get out of my head, Gumtree algorithms, conspiracy. No, but seriously, you type, you type it's like bookshelf, and it's like bookshelf, 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 gramophone. <laughs> bookshelf, 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 combine harvester. What the f***? <laughs> That's actually a pretty good price. <laughs> anyway, on this particular day, I found two bookshelves that worked for me in terms of cost and, more importantly, geographical convenience, because I'd be f if I'm driving to Broadmeadows to pick up a bookshelf, right? So <laughs> I type in bookshelf and I see the two things and I'm like, okay, one seller is Kathy, the other is Morgan. I send them both the same text message. Hello, I saw your bookshelf on Gumtree. Is it still available? Kathy texts back straight away saying, Sorry! It went this morning! <laughs> That's cool, Kathy. I'm sorry I gave you an annoying voice in the retelling of this story. <laughs> Morgan's response came through a couple of minutes later and simply read, It was my wife's bookshelf. <laughs> How do you respond to that? Aside from the fact that it doesn't answer my f***ing question, <laughs> His use of past tense in that sentence unnerved me slightly. I'm like, oh, I should probably just find another bookshelf. And then I noticed he lived in the suburb next to me, so I replied, is it still available? He responded with the letter Y. Just a Y? Is he asking me why I want to know if it's still available? Or is it a why for yes, and he's so in the throes of grief that he can't manage the E and the S? <laughs> I assume it's a why for yes, so I respond, cool, I'll take it. When's a good time to come and pick it up? 
No reply for 15 minutes. I'm like, oh, he's forgotten about me. F I'll find another bookshelf. And then when his reply actually does come through, I realise he spent those 15 minutes crafting his response because it's a f thesis. <laughs> he must have felt so bad about only using a single consonant in his previous text that he just massively overcompensated with this one. <laughs> also, for some reason, felt that the use of punctuation entirely unnecessary. <laughs> so it's just one obscenely long sentence which reads, you must come and pick up now. I only have short time here at house and also it wide. So bring van or trailer and their stair, but I can help you carry downstairs. If you come park out front, walk up past ring bell and I will help you carry it to trailer or van. I only accept cash. And if you do not come now, I will sell it someone else. <laughs> I should just find another bookshelf at this point. <laughs> but now I am fascinated by Morgan and I simply must meet the man. So I drive over to his house. Oh, before I left, I sent him a message saying, cool, I'll be there in 10 minutes. He replied, okay, but spelt it okay a y which just fascinated me more that he'll use four letters to spell a two-letter word but only one letter to spell a three-letter word. Morgan is off the... <laughs> and as I'm driving over to his house, I'm trying to picture what he's going to be like, you know. His pigeon English might suggest ethnicity of some sort, but I don't want to racially profile him. Maybe he's an old man who recently lost his wife and he's not that very good at texting. Or maybe, and I'm really hoping this is the case, Morgan is just crazy. So I get to his house and I go up to the, I park out front, walk up path, ring bell, and I, I brace myself for the door to be opened by like an old man in a smoking jacket, wearing fishnet stockings and suspenders, just puffing on an opium pipe, while a butler just creepily polishes a goldfish in the background. And then a tiny pug dog wearing a fez hat just trots up the hallway, sits on the mat, looks up at me and says, Welcome to our lovely room! <laughs> and then the door opens and I am thoroughly disappointed. Before me stands an average Caucasian male in his mid-thirties, dressed casually, hipster chic, stubble, glasses with designer frames, expensive watch. I immediately think architect, but the house is too cheesy for that. It's like a double-storey doll's house with bay windows. But definitely a designer of some kind, maybe a graphic designer. He's too skinny for manual labour. He's too hip for the public sector. But this can't be Morgan! Because Morgan's text messages would suggest that he's not that technically savvy. And then the man standing in front of me says, Hello, my name's Morgan. And the plot thickens! <laughs> he invites me in, shakes my hand, closes the door, and 20 minutes later, I will be witnessing Morgan perform some of the most aggressive acts of violence I've ever seen in my life. And I will be speeding away in my car, bleeding from the face. <laughs> Here's how this went down. <laughs> I go into the house and I notice two things immediately. One, this is a house in the throes of renovation. Nothing too extreme, but there's like drop sheets on all the furniture, there's freshly painted walls, there's a bathtub wrapped in plastic in the hallway awaiting installation. Someone's doing some work on this house. The second thing I notice, on the way up the stairs to the second floor, on the first floor landing, is a wedding photograph featuring a very cleanly shaven Morgan with a very beautiful bride. Very much in love. The photograph is very much on the floor and the glass in the frame is very much smashed. She's not dead, she's left him, and the plot thickens a bit more for Morgan. <laughs> and as Morgan unceremoniously, like, kicks the photo frame to one side on the way up the stairs, I really wanted to pry into Morgan's life and ask heaps of inappropriate questions. <laughs> but he was clearly a broken man. He had this terrible air of sadness around him, so I didn't want to intrude. 
Luckily for me, though, I didn't have to because Morgan immediately began oversharing and told me the whole f***ing story. Ah! Thank you, Morgan! I shall hang off your every word and then retell your tale to 200 strangers and record it for a f***ing DVD. <laughs> <clears throat> a graphic designer, yes, and he's really good at it. He does like massive rebranding campaigns for large corporations. He gets flown all over the world doing this, right? About four years ago, a woman hired Morgan to rebrand her florist business, and he did such a great job, she married him. And he thought everything was just fine, until about three months ago, Morgan had to do a presentation in Sydney, right? But he was on his way home from overseas and he got stuck in Dubai due to a flight cancellation. So rather than cancel the meeting, Morgan suggested to these businessmen in Sydney that they do a Skype chat because he's so technologically savvy despite his <laughs> baffling text message style. <laughs> So Morgan checks into a hotel, cracks open his laptop and starts Skyping with this room full of businessmen in Sydney who are all watching Morgan on a massive screen on their boardroom wall, right? And everything's going great. Morgan is totally nailing it until about halfway through, he realises that a file he wants to show these dudes is on the desktop of his home computer back in his home office in Melbourne. And he decides to live share the desktop of his home computer on the Skype chat. He knows how to do that. He can control his computer remotely from anywhere in the world. It's not particularly new technology, but Morgan makes it sound so impressive. So this room full of businessmen are all watching keenly like, oh, Margaret, bring in some biscuits. There's some newfangled going on in here. As Morgan clicks a few buttons and brings up the desktop of his home computer on the Skype chat. Now, what Morgan doesn't realise is that his wife has been using the photo booth app on that particular computer to take pictures of herself. To take naked pictures of herself. To take naked pictures of herself doing some pretty <laughs> dumb shit. It's embarrassing to say the least. Just as Margaret came back in with the biscuits, I've got you the... <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with the Photo Booth app will know that how it works is it accesses the built-in camera in your computer and with a click of a button, takes a photo of you when you're standing in front of the screen. And if you know that, you'll also know that if you leave that application open, the camera also stays open, witnessing whatever may be happening in front of the computer in real time. Such as your wife in your home office <laughs> your best mate. goes on to tell me she's keeping the house, his former best mate is moving in, and while they're out for the day happily shopping for fittings, Morgan must suffer the indignity of moving his out and selling the stuff they don't want on Gumtree to this guy. Oh, oh. It's at this point of the story that Morgan starts crying. He breaks down and I do not blame the man. It's horrible and I just want to give him a big hug and say everything's gonna be all right Morgan but I am holding the full weight of a bookshelf halfway down a set of stairs and Morgan is the only thing stopping that bookshelf from caving my face in I was like Morgan <laughs> And Morgan managed to pull himself together for about eight seconds and then just went bah, and let the bookshelf go. I fell backwards. It literally rolled over me and took out the light hanging above the staircase. I'm now lying on my back getting showered in broken glass as the bookshelf turned end over end and just went thunk right through a freshly painted wall at the bottom of the stairs. I'm like, oh, 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 oh. tiny cut on my forehead which is just blood for some reason apart from that I'm fine <laughs> Morgan however he's not fine <laughs> Morgan is the opposite of fine <laughs> something happened when the bookshelf lodged itself in the wall and his sadness just went away in a second and he started himself laughing <laughs> hysterical and he had 
the creepiest laugh I've ever heard in my life. I'm standing going, this is weird, and he's going, Bruh. Bruh. like some sort of demonically possessed baritone kookaburra. It's like, Bruh. Uh, uh, Bruh. Uh, can I still have the bookshelf? He's like, yeah. We extracted from the wall. The bookshelf, incidentally, showing no sign of having just rolled down a staircase and smashed through a wall. We carried it out to my car. We had to stop about six times because Morgan was like, hang on a minute. We got it to my car, put it on the trailer, and Morgan was in such a great mood, he let me have the bookshelf for free. Oh! <laughs> mm. And that's where the story should end. <laughs> but there was something about the bookshelf going through the wall that flipped a <laughs> switch in Morgan's head, and he is now hungry for more destruction. <laughs> so as I started tying the, the bookshelf down to my trailer, Morgan just strolls over to like an upright mailbox on the front lawn and just starts trying to wrench it out of the ground, just really putting his back into it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, you okay, buddy? He's like, yep. Mm -hmm. He pulls it out of the ground, whereupon he wields it like a battle axe and just starts smashing up the front garden, just beheading the daisies, get up the lavender. I'm like, oh, hey, Morgan, maybe you want to stop and think about that. And he wheeled around and looked at me like Jack Nicholson chasing Shelley Duval up the stairs in The Shining and said, why don't you mind your own business? Yep, yep, cool, man, yep, yep. Now, I like tying knots. I'm quite good at tying knots. If I tie something down, I take my time because I want it to stay there. But as Morgan nonchalantly strolled up the driveway, rolled up the garage door, and put the mailbox through the windscreen of an Audi? I must admit, I kind of rushed my knot tying job. I got in the car, I'm about to drive off. I'm like looking at the house going, oh. Oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. And then an armchair smashed out of an upstairs window and just went doink, 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 doink down the front lawn. I was like, <sighs> what's my duty of care in this situation? <laughs> I didn't want to call the cops on him. I didn't want him to trash the house. I'm like, God, ah, I'm going to have to talk to Morgan. <laughs> so I got out. I walked up the driveway, shitting myself. You know when someone does something really violent and you're just like, God, ah, we're not supposed to do it like that. Yucky, just yucky feeling in my tum tum and I'm standing there, standing there in the garage and there's like an adjoining door in the garage that leads into the house. I can see in through that, through the door into the house, up the staircase. It's like a wooden staircase and I'm standing in the garage just going, oh, Morgan. <laughs> Like I was calling a cat for its dinner. Like, muggy, 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 muggy. <laughs> and then I notice a small trickle of water start to come from the top step. And then a little bit more water, and then, so, and then quite a lot of water. Just <laughs> down the stairs like a <laughs> water feature. I'm like, ah, oh, that can't be right. And then Morgan appeared on the top step holding a hammer like this. Bah! I was like, whoa! He's like, Bruh! Starts running at me, wielding the hammer, going, Bruh. I'm like, oh, no, man, I just wanted to buy your bookshelf. He's like, Bruh. Bruh. Runs straight past me. I'm like, where are you going? He's like, Bruh. made a beeline for my car. I'm like, no, man, stop. He's like, Bruh. stop it, just stop. He spins around and goes, I just checked my phone. She texted me 15 minutes ago saying she'll be here in 15 minutes. We gotta go, and gets into my car. Jesus me. <laughs> I run down the lawn, get in the driver's seat. I'm like, what was with the water? He goes, oh, I put plugs in all of the sinks and turned all the taps on. I'm like, oh, that's f He's like, just drive. I was like, nah. 
I took off so quick, rounded the corner at the end of his street, and the bookshelf just went, boosh, and exploded against the guardrail. Just exploded in a shower of badly tied knots and broken dreams. <laughs> so me and Morgan just left it there like a little breadcrumb for his ex-wife to find on the way home to her destroyed gingerbread house i dropped morgan at a train station i have never seen him again and that my friends is why i no longer shop on gumtree thank you very much thank you very much <laughs> uh. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know my favourite bit of that story? I just made it up. <laughs> yeah, it's not true. There is no Morgan. Oh! It's very unsatisfying, isn't it? But I saw him in my head. I saw Morgan in my head. Why is it we can feel so robbed when someone tells us a story we just heard isn't true and yet so satisfied at the end of a fictional novel? Eh? No, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> you know the other great thing about that story? First draft. <laughs> you, Hemingway! 